I would advise, especially any young woman, to sort of try and put the gender aside and just think of yourself as, as a professional and as a human and as an architect and, um, and approach things from that perspective. Business of Architecture, episode 334. Hello, and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice that helps you to do your best work more often. Today's episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture step-by-step business training program for architects that shows you how to structure your practice so you can focus on doing your best work instead of being bogged down with the complexity of running a business. Build the business you need to do the work that you want. Discover more by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart. Today's show is also sponsored by Layer App, the flexible database for architects that makes it easy to view and share photos, files, and project data right in Revit. Get a completely free 14-day trial to go check it out by visiting layer.team forward slash B-O-A. That's layer, L-A-Y-E-R dot team, T-E-A-M forward slash B-O-A. Today, I have the honor and privilege of speaking with Juliet Gamolina. She's dedicated to the built environment and the visibility and advancement of the women who work in it. She's the director of strategy at Trahan Architects, a global architecture firm where she focuses on new business, digital communications, and brand development. Julia is also the founder and editorial director of madamarchitect.org, an online publication about, by, and for the women that advance the practice of architecture. Thus far, Julia has interviewed over 125 architects and designers, as well as CEOs, publicists, journalists, business strategists, counsel, and more. Her writing has also been featured in Fast Company, A Woman's Thing, Metropolis Magazine, Architizer, and The Architects Newspaper. She's a founding member of The Wing, a network of community spaces for women, as well as a member of Brick and Wonder, a member of the Female Founder Collective, a fellow of the Urban Design Forum, and a communications co-chair of the ULI, which is Urban Land Institute's New York Young Leaders Group. In 2019, Julia received a special citation from AIA New York for her work with Madame Architect, and she was named one of the professional women in construction's 20 under 40. She served on juries for the 2019 World Architecture Festival and the DNA Paris Design Awards and has held various speaking engagements at Harvard, Columbia, Yale, University, uh, UPenn, Pratt, Georgia Tech, and more. Julie received her Bachelor of Architecture at Cornell University, graduating with the Charles Goodwin Sands Memorial Medal for Exceptional Merit in the Thesis of Architecture. She's based in New York City. Welcome, Julie, to the Business of Architecture podcast. Thank you, Enoch. I'm so happy to be speaking with you. Now, I have to admit that was that was a mouthful of a bio and an introduction. You've done a lot, that Julia. That was a mouthful. <laughs> Do you think? Thank you. It doesn't feel like it. It just feels like I'm, you know, I don't know, living my life. <laughs> tell me, tell me what drives you. I mean, this really, this is a lot. Uh, I don't see a gray hair on your head yet. Um, <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> sure. I, I, you know, I had a pretty dense childhood. I mean, I, I think, you know, my parents lodged a lot in there. Um, always a lot of extracurriculars. You know, I went to school. I, I'm from Russia. I grew up there. Um, and I just remember on top of school school, I also was in this other, like, performing arts school where we did, you know, singing and dance and a couple of foreign languages, um, all this stuff. And then, you know, I had art lessons on the side and dance lessons on the side and all kinds of things on the side. And my life has always been sort of go, go, go from, from very early on. But I don't know. I just, I think I've, I've always had a lot of energy, a lot of interests. I, I really like people. Um, I'm, you know, I need a lot of visual stimulation. I like to be out and about and seeing things. So I think it, you know, all accumulates from that. And what was the genesis of Madame Architect? It's no easy feat to launch an online publication and keep it updated and do that in addition to your full-time employment. Sure, yeah. Thankfully, I really like 
everything that it involves, you know, from from just even scheduling conversations to having them to editing everything. So so it doesn't feel like a lot. But the genesis, I mean, goes all the way back again to my upbringing in Russia. You know, we immigrated twice, um, first to Toronto and then to Colorado, where I went to high school. Um, and very early on, my mom sort of sat me down and said, you know, I'm your mother. There's obviously ways I will guide you. Um, but I'm also new here. You know, I've never taken the SATs. I've never applied to U.S. colleges. Uh, I've never written a cover letter for my first job. Like, you're on your own for that. So you better find some resources to help you along with those kinds of things. Um, and she encouraged me to talk to my teachers. And so from a very young age, as a young girl, I would go to speak to my teachers. And I would always, you know, I chose women because they were sort of mother figures. And that's what I was comfortable with as a young kid. Um, I did that all my life, all through elementary, middle school, high school, and then college. And once I graduated um, and started working in a design firm as a designer, as an architect, one thing I, I noticed two things. Um, the first is that that sort of built-in system of mentorship and guidance that your professors naturally provide for you wasn't there anymore. Um, you know, I was working at a small boutique firm, you know, uh, not a lot of people. And so obviously you're not going to go to to somebody and, and talk about your growth plans and the fact that you want to be there for one more year, then you want to move on, right? You need outside resources. Um, and the other thing also at the firm that I worked is that there weren't a lot of women, not a lot of women that I could kind of go to in the way that I was used to. So I, you know, I took it upon myself, uh, found some mentors and, um, and the other thing, uh, I had always written a lot. I had one, you know, in a similar way how at Cornell I, I um, got the Charles Good Goodwin Sands Medal. Um, all through my schooling, I got all kinds of English awards uh, at graduations, which was kind of interesting. And they, you know, I thought maybe those things would be for art, but they weren't. They were for for writing. And so writing is something that I had always wanted to do and wanted to keep up, and wasn't really seeing opportunities for how I could easily do that when I first graduated. Um, and so once I met some of these mentors and kind of started having conversations with them, I was so inspired and energized by advice that I was getting um, that I really wanted to share it. And I saw the opportunity to share it as also an opportunity to start writing more. And so Madam Architect came out of out of that. You know, I, I was uh, a member of a nonprofit, Architects, that was founded by a professor of mine. They had an online journal. I pitched them an interview idea, did it, did a few more offhand, and then it just kind of snowballed into what Madam Architect is today. And what is the purpose of Madame Architect? Sure, that's a, that's a great question. I think the purpose is to show all kinds of careers that one could have after studying architecture. I know when I was in school, I, I'm really thankful for my training, as, as I'm sure you are too, coming out of Cornell. It's, it's a really great, um, you know, really great incubator. Um, but I will say that it did feel like we were all exposed to one track when we were there, you know, and that was this architect and the founder of their own firm uh, on an international stage. And uh, A, not a lot of women in, in that level. Um, you, you know, we had Zaha and we had Liz and I didn't really see my life panning out in the same way that theirs did. And so, you know, I, I thought, uh, what kind of life is possible for me if I want to stay in architecture, but I don't necessarily want to be, uh, want to be that. And um, so I think that's really where the mission comes from is uh, what kinds of things are women doing in the field? What else is possible? What can you do with the skills that you do get in architecture school and, and et cetera? What have been some, after interviewing so many people and different architects, thought leaders, consultants, what have been some of the, perhaps the key takeaways, Julie, that you've gotten from being able to interface mm. with so many people, especially women in the architecture industry? Sure. The main one I think can apply to anyone regardless of gender, and it's that you know, I always thought to have a fulfilling career and for your career to be that what you want it to be, you have to be very strategic. You kind of have to set your eyes on the prize and just not look anywhere else sort of. Um, and actually, maybe in some ways that that's true, but mostly the number one takeaway from everyone I've talked to is that actually if you follow your interests at the time um, and you make decisions based on that, just things you're excited for that make sense at the time, it's actually a much better way to build something authentic for yourself and to be doing something that you're actually meant to be doing. Doing. I mean, I know when I was graduating from, from architecture school, again, my like bullseye was, okay, great, I'm going to, I guess I'll be a partner at a firm, and that didn't quite sit well with me, and, you know, it is in following those more authentic interests that, is all, that have always been there, that I've been, been able to, you know, do Madam Architect, and I think a lot of the people that I've interviewed have said similar things. Amazing, and where do you find that your interests are taking you now? 
Oh my gosh, I would really love to expand Madam Architect to other types of media, I think, and, and in general, just, um, you know, for the for the general cause of, of architects that are women to be highlighted more and, and not to be called architects that are women, but just architects, I think it has to go beyond journalism. I mean, I think that's step one is just, you know, showcase some, some more of those stories in magazines and interviews, you know, what I'm doing with Madam Architect, what you're doing with, with this podcast. Um, but I think taking it further, you know, documentaries, books, um, fiction books. I mean, I keep saying this, but, you know, we have Howard Rourke in the Fountainhead, you know, where is the, where is the female protagonist in something like this, right? So I think that's where I want to focus my energies next. What, what are some of the challenges that you find that women architects face in this day and age? Gosh, uh, all of it. Uh, I think there's still inherent bias there. I mean, um, just the way women are spoken to and, you know, and young women too. I mean, I, I'm a woman in the field. I'm also a relatively young woman in the field, very young woman in the field. And, you know, I'll, I'll have people say to me things like, oh, that little thing you did is so nice. And, you know, it's not little, it's, it's a thing, it's a contribution. Um, it took thought and strategy, you know, so I think anytime you put the word little in front of, uh, in front of the way you're talking about a woman or anything she does is, is, is not good. Um, so some bias in there, I think, um, opportunities for advancement, um, pipeline things. I mean, I think it's getting better, but I think all of the issues are still the same. And, and, and even things like, you know, motherhood and, and family planning and how you balance that with your career. I mean, to this day, you know, women that have to leave early from work are kind of given the side eye and, you know, are expected to parent as though they don't work and work as though they don't parent. So um, I'm hoping to see some some significant change soon, but I would say it's uh, it's not fast enough. What What advice would you give to any women listeners are listening to this podcast and may feel may feel stuck or maybe just looking for some advice that that you've experienced in your career sure what's really helped me is um is just being very real with with my reality at the moment so if someone does make a comment um or questions your expertise or whatever don't defend it or or say you know you're saying this because i'm a woman that tends to not work, I, th I think, or it hasn't, it hasn't always worked. Um, what does work, though, is if someone questions your experience or what you have to contribute is to say, like, why you're contributing, where you're contributing and where it actually comes from. So you can say, well, you know, I've been focusing on this kind of work for seven years and this is a situation I've seen over and over again. And so that's where, uh, you know, my thoughts are coming from, things like this. Um, yeah, I would, I would advise, especially any young woman, to sort of try and put the gender aside and just think of yourself as, as a professional and as a human and as an architect and, um, and approach things from that perspective. Julie, you have a wealth of great resources on Madame Architect. I encourage all of our listeners to go read some of the fantastic interviews over there. I'm just curious, any interviews come to mind of yours? Obviously, you probably love all of them, but have there been any that have been your favorites that you've thought that was a unique insight or that, was, that one had some particularly useful content for me? Which ones stand out for you? Sure. There's two that stand out that are really significant. Um, Jean Brownhill, who's the founder and CEO of Sweeten. It's a tech platform that connects, you know, those wishing to renovate their home with with contractors and other design professionals. And they just really do beautiful work. Um, she's an Af she's African-American. She's a black woman. She's a founder. She, you know, she's raised significant money for this company and really built it up. Um, she's just so smart and so smart in transferring her architectural skills and what she's learned both in studying it and, and, and working as an architect. She worked as a designer for, for a number of years, I think, before she she, she launched um, Sweeten. And so I encourage everyone to read that interview if you're, you know, thinking of starting your own thing or, or thinking how you can transfer your skills to just a, something a little bit different. Um, and the other one is Kim Holden, who was one of the original founders of Shop Architects. I mean, she's she's so amazing, very warm, very nurturing, like a, a, a woman's woman, a girl's girl, you know what I mean? And she's interesting because she, even when she was at Shop and building Shop, she, she has had two daughters and for both of those births, she had a doula and a midwife and just was so grateful for what they offered during the experience that she wanted to drop everything and become a doula. And, you know, she had to say to herself, listen, get a grip. You have this burgeoning young firm. You, you have this degree, like you need to focus on architecture right now. Um, but finally, once shop was, you know, off the ground enough and once she knew, she describes it as once she knew the wheels wouldn't fall off without her after having implemented some, you know, really key systems 
systems to keep the ground running there, that's when she felt she could finally make the leap. And now she's a doula. And um, what's amazing about that is, you know, she applies her design skills both to like literally a woman's body for like the best way to design how you're going to give birth um, all the way to birthing rooms and birthing floors. I mean, she talks a lot about how in Denmark, uh, birthing rooms look like yoga gyms or spas or something. They have all these, uh, like, just all this equipment that looks like exercise equipment. Whereas in the States, it's super clinical, you know, very rigid, very scary in a lot of ways. Um, and so I think not only is she aiming to improve a woman's pregnancy, birth, and postpartum experience, literally like, you know, inside a woman's head and her own body, but also just the surrounding, which, which is really awesome. Uh, those are both incredible, incredible articles. So we'll definitely link to those in the show notes. So those of you who want to come over and listen to this episode, this is going to be episode 334. And please come look in the show notes for that. Incredible. Thank you, Julia, for sharing that. Thank you. Anything else that's unsaid about Madame Architect that you'd like to, to tell our audience? Uh, I'd like to transition over to some of your, your other professional endeavors. But before we, j we jump off of that, obviously, th there's a lot going on there. Anything that we've missed or something that you want to highlight and bring out about, about that work? Mm, I think I do. There's, there's one thing. You know, people often ask us to do uh, networking sessions or mentorship sessions or something that connects the community a lot better, which, which I completely agree with. I think, you know, we've built this amazing community very organically, um, you know, no paid advertising or marketing or anything like this. Um, but one thing that I think that's been really successful with Madam Architect is that everything that we've done hasn't really been done before. I mean, of course, there's been interviews with women before, but not quite uh, interviews that are so intimate, um, so vulnerable, but also just like the, the focus on it just being women and about the entirety of their careers. And, and that goes, you know, that that's the same for a lot of our other content too. Like we recently launched Creative Compliments where we showcase artwork by architects because I think, you know, so much of design now is so digital and everything's being done on the computer and that takes away a little bit from, from kind of the heart and soul of, of, of real design. And so we're trying to bring that back a little bit. And I think if I were to launch anything and maybe this taps into sort of uh, future plans for the company and, and how it can be sustainable, um, I don't think we would do what's already being done. You know, there's so many mentorship sessions and mentorship opportunities right now. There's so many networking opportunities. And also we don't want to spread out the the concentration either. You know, if the AIA women's group is doing a lot of wonderful things, like we'd just rather send people that way. Um, so I think the next step for me will also be to figure out how do we connect our community members together, um, but in a way that hasn't been done before. And I'm looking forward to that. Uh, absolutely incredible. I mean, it sounds like you have a very, a pretty clear vision, maybe not total clarity on what you want to do, but I hear coming through that you have definite ideas about how you want to pull that off and the, the guidepost that will guide you along the way. I think so. Yeah. Well, tell me about your, your traditional path. So as you mentioned, we both went to Cornell University, which was an incredible school to go to and very much kind of all around the, what you said is like the architect kind of track, meaning that it's very theoretical. <laughs> Uh, it's very much around the built environment as as an expression or a response to something or a continuation of a dialogue of, of what's happening in the world of architecture. And right now you are the director of strategy at Trahan Architects. So what goes into your current job role? What do you do on a day to day basis? Sure, it's it's super interesting. And actually, Trey, Trey Trahan, a somebody that would be a great interview for, for a podcast, but also an amazing boss because he, he's just given me complete autonomy to to help raise the profile of Trahan and kind of get it off the ground in New York. But anyway, so backtracking a little bit, um, strategy for Trey, I mean, strategy means a lot of different things for a lot of firms. There's one firm that I know that has a director of strategy and their focus is design strategy very early on in a project. So once, you know, once they have a client right before they're about to start designing, they have to figure out what exactly they're designing for and that's what this person focuses on and that's strategy in, in, in that respect. Um, when it applies to me, it's very different. It's it's basically getting a startup off the ground and it's business strategy, it's brand strategy, you know, it's communication strategy, it's all those things. Um, 
And I think, you know, Trey tapped me for that role because because of the sort of non-traditional combination of experiences I have, both in design and then in communications and business development at other firms, but also in Matt, with Madam Architect and, you know, just getting it off the ground and building a following and like the skills and kind of the thinking and the mentality that has to go into that. Um, so strategy at Trey Han and for B really means, you know, we're a new presence in New York. We have very solid backing in New Orleans. The firm is New Orleans based, um, but we have this burgeoning office in New York and, and yeah, how do we raise the profile? How do we make sure people know we're here? How do we build in the Northeast and, and beyond and internationally? So that's kind of some, something on me to figure out for us. What do you find is working so far for building the profile? Yeah. Uh, oh, gosh. I mean, this is the thing. I think I think it really is about a holistic effort. I mean, I think a lot of architects see business development as uh, RFP and RFQ submissions. And that is just one. That is just one bucket of like 10 things that you need to be doing. So, you know, speaking to press is one thing. Social media is a huge thing nowadays and becoming more and more important. Um, what else, you know, just uh, beating people here, both clients and, you know, leaders of organizations and partners, strategic partners, you know, who do we work with on this? Who do we partner on this? Who do we have a strategic team with in place before we even hear of a new project that we know we can, you know, start preparing for it right away in case a project is announced, those kinds of things. Um, so it, it is a lot of boots on the ground. It's really important to be in the city and in New York. And that's why my efforts are really focused here. I mean, my efforts are focused on, on what we're doing as a brand and as a company overall in New Orleans too um but yeah being being here and being able to meet people here is really important how much of what you do could be considered architecture now we, we could have a broad definition and say everything we all do is architecture but i'm just curious in a job sense mm -hmm. are you more on the marketing bd side are you doing any design what's I'm not doing design right now. I am involved in some very early stages of projects, mostly with kind of um, client liaison things and, and interviewing, you know, interviewing the client, kind of sussing out the, the heart of what they want, which I think I you know, have some experience in. Um, but it's interesting. One thing we talk a lot about is like, how can architects contribute beyond architecture? I mean, architects are really interesting professionals. Like everyone is super well-rounded. You know, the education we have is both technical and theoretical, visual and, and you know, oral communication is a huge thing. I mean, architects are like, their brains are really fascinating with all the skills that they have and all the skills that they learn. And so how can we apply to that to beyond the making of buildings? You know, uh, and that's something we talk a lot about is like, you know, Trey has a lot of philanthropic efforts going on. He's an art collector, so he has his uh, his fingers in a lot of different things. And a lot of what we talk about in terms of strategy is how do we bring all of those things together to both inform architecture and also go beyond. And again, that's sort of my role to figure out. It's not about the making of architecture, but about what architecture and architects can do for the world. And I mean, ab absolutely fascinating that, that you've uh, taken this sort of career path. As you mentioned, Madame Architect, I invite our listeners to go there, check out all the different variations of career paths within architecture. There are just absolutely so many. And Julia, how did you get into, I don't know how to say it, the, the softer side of the architecture, I mean, the people side, uh, business development, as opposed to going to traditional design route? How did that transition happen for you? Sure. I think, gosh, I mean, it goes so far back. Like I said, even before when I was talking about my childhood and kind of mentioning that I really liked people, I think that was always going to be the case in a way. I always loved talking to people and getting to know them. I actually just thought back to my very first internship, which was in Brazil. It was in Belo Horizonte, Minas Gerais, which is like the Colorado of Brazil. Very first internship happened through a Cornell classmate of mine who was getting her master's and, you know, had this firm and I went and, and worked for her. Um, but I remember being there and I was meeting so many fascinating people. And I just remember having a thought even back then, like I would love to just interview people all over the world when I, you know, when I travel for, for work or for school and like put it in a book or something like that thought was already happening back then. And Humans of New York was, was something that I, that I read a lot and just like uh, those very intimate and vulnerable stories too. So I think the interest was always there. And I also, I, I mentioned writing a lot. I was a really voracious reader and the things that I was most drawn to were like biographies, autobiographies, coming of age stories. So I don't know. I don't know if it has to do with immigrating and kind of having to find my own place in the world and, you know, adapt to what's going on around me and kind of find my story in a way. But I've just always been drawn to how, 
you know, how people make the choices that they do and how their lives turn out to be what they are and, and the difference and all those things. And so the first job out of school, was it was a traditional design position or was it something in the marketing and the business development side of the firm? No, it was a traditional design position. And it's so interesting. I didn't feel like myself. Mm. I would, you know, sit at my computer and be drafting and just feel so weird. I don't know any other word for it. And I couldn't figure out if it, I was just inexperienced at that point and just needed, you know, to learn the programs better so I could become faster. So it would feel more natural to me, but it never really ended up feeling natural. And I noticed two things. One thing is my favorite my favorite parts of the day and the things I looked forward to the most were meetings, were meetings with the client where we could all talk about the goals and talk about the project and get to know everyone and get to know their expertise. And I was really lucky in that my first job, my boss was very transparent um, in terms of allowing his junior designers, you know, anyone to attend all the meetings, to be in all the conversations and all the emails. And so I, I really saw kind of everything that was going on. Um, so I noticed that. And the other thing I noticed is, uh, he would, you know, have photographers in the office, he would have journalists in the office, and he himself would be having all these conversations with fascinating creatives kind of in a different, um, uh, how could I say this, sort of in a different sphere of things, but still in the industry. And yeah, I always paid attention to that, just kind of being fascinated by all the people he was talking to that he was inviting into the office and also really loving to go out for these meetings. And so I think that's when I started to think like maybe something in communications, press, marketing might be a good fit. And so then from there, did you did you make that transition while working at that firm? I'm curious, or did you look for another position that, that included that kind of yeah, it was, it took a little bit of time. I, after that firm, I went to another firm, was also a designer and I went there, they focused on workplace design with um, slightly faster timelines. And I think I was looking for that too, just a little bit of a faster pace and then honestly, just a faster reward uh, <laughs> than, than, you know, the, the few years it takes to get a development off the ground. Um, and at that firm, they hired this wonderful German art historian who uh, did communications for an art gallery before, and she was doing communications for this firm and honestly I was just fascinated by her she was one of these people that were you know international and that I had really wanted to get to know and um, we had gotten to know each other and then I just said to her offhand I think my project was on a lull for a couple of weeks and I said hey if you ever need any help like I would love to do whatever you need write egg research and so I did and I started with that um research different media outlets we could pitch to. I started running the social media account and it was so much of it was about writing, which again, I was, I was really craving to do as well. Um, and that's where I, when I realized that this is something I wanted to focus on full time. Unfortunately at this firm, I wasn't able to focus on it full time because uh, they just didn't have the budget for it. You know, it's a completely overhead position and not a lot of, uh, you know, evolving firms can afford something like that. So I ended up going somewhere else and then ended up at FX Collaborative doing business development. And then from there, kind of that whole combination of experiences led me to Trahan. Fantastic. Julie, where, where do you see, you know, with your kind of 30,000 foot view of, of publishing, interviewing, mm -hmm. plus also being in the trenches, working at Trahan Architects and the communications in a startup, what are the overall trends that you see yeah. in the architecture industry? Where is this all going? Are you seeing any trends or changes that we're looking at over the next 10 years, especially considering COVID-19, which we're just into right now? I'm curious on, now I know you're not, you're not a fortune teller, but I'm curious from where you're sitting, what are the trends <laughs> and uh, things that you might be interested in seeing or, or seeing in the future? Sure. Yeah, that's a really wonderful question. Um, one thing for sure is, is what I mentioned before about architects contributing to the world in ways beyond architecture, beyond the making of buildings. Again, they're just such fascinating minds and there's so much in there that we learned both in school and, and, and working and, and working to get a building off the ground and collaborating with so many different kinds of people from lighting designers to landscape architects to marketing consultants, all of this that I think there's really something there. I think architects could are notorious for not being great business people, but I think could be really amazing business people and kind of creative leaders just for the world at large. Um, you know, I, I read things like Fast Company and tech is a huge thing, obviously. I mean, you know, uh, uh, tech startups and tech founders are kind of the the celebrities uh, in, in, a, in the business world right now. But I think architects are the next thing, mm. honestly. I think that's, that's going to be a big thing. Um, so that's a trend. I, I do think a return to some of the more analog design styles and 
you know, uh, digital technology took off so quickly, fabrication methods, parametrics took off so quickly that I do think, you know, things like that have peaks and troughs and peaks and troughs. And I think a trough is coming where people will be looking back to the analog and things they can make with their hands and handcraft and handmaking and, th and things like this. There's, you know, these things go through cycles. And then in terms of, in terms of um, just general image and, and brand, I think video is huge. Just telling, you know, you, you go on all these new websites for architects and videos are the first things that you see and you really get this immersive experience. So I think both on social media, um, and, and, you know, in other online platforms, I think video will be huge. I'm, I'm hoping to see architects start to make films. You know, a lot of fashion houses started to get into films and treating their, their commercials as like these beautiful, uh, like art film creations. And yeah, I think the architects are the next to do that as well. Amazing. Well, Julia, thank you for joining us here, sharing with us your, your journey, your experience, your insights. Where can people go? Where should they go uh, to follow you and your work? Sure. So I'll, I'll give three things. They should go to madamarchitect.org, madam with an E. <laughs> they can also go to trahanarchitects.com and check out our videos and the way we showcase our projects, uh, kind of going back to what I just talked about. And then I'm on social media on Instagram at julia.gamalina. Thank you, Julia. Thank you so much. And that's a wrap. Today's episode is sponsored by Smart Practices the world's leading step-by-step -step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture. Because you see, it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back. It's the complexity of running a business, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. So if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. Today's episode is also sponsored by Layer App. Layer App takes all of your project related data, photos, and files and makes them accessible with the click of a button right in Revit. So, let me tell you how this works. It took me a while to get the concept. Uh, say that you go to a job site and you take a bunch of pictures. Now, you get back to the office with your camera loaded down with hundreds, perhaps even thousands of pictures. And now it's your job to organize them in a way that makes sense so you and other team members can easily find and use them later. What a nightmare. Now, imagine instead that instead of wrestling with categorizing photos and renaming them and trying to organize them in folders, that the moment you took the photos on your smartphone, they were immediately linked to your Revit model where you or other team members could access them with the click of a button. This is what Layer App does. You can also link other project data like spec sheets, project notes, and anything else to elements right within Revit. So here are two reasons why I thought, as a listener, you'd want to try out Layer App. Number one, if you currently work for a firm, the last thing you want to be working on is tedious work like categorizing and organizing project information. If you're a firm owner or principal, your firm could save thousands in staff time just by using this app, not to mention the convenience of having project data at your fingertips right when you need it. I hope this is a valuable resource for you. If you use Revit, Layer App is a must-have. Find out more and get a completely free 14-day trial at layer.team forward slash BOA. It's layer, L-A-Y-E-R dot T-E-A-M forward slash B-O-A. And by the way, if you listen to episode 338, you can hear my interview with Zach Soflin, the founder and CEO of Layer App, the architect turned software developer who created the product. And get your free trial at layer.team forward slash B-O-A. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.